Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. And, uh, you know, I want to begin just by saying that I have been truly humbled these last couple of weeks with all of the new viewers and subscribers that have joined the channel. And I want to welcome all of you to Teaching with Power. Uh, I'm so grateful that I get the opportunity to share my love of the scriptures with so many people around the world each week. So thank you for joining us, and I hope that you'll enjoy your experience studying the Book of Mormon with us uh, throughout this year. Now, the purpose of this channel is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. And for teachers, if you're interested in obtaining the handouts, the slides, the lesson plans that I put together to help teachers reduce their preparation time and increase their confidence in the classroom, you just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. I also have links in the video description below to a, a subscription service that I make available to teachers as well, if you're interested. But without any further ado, let's get into the scriptures. This week, we're going to be studying 1 Nephi chapters 11 through 15. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And before we dig deep into the individual chapters of this week's study, let's do a bit of an overview of this section of scripture first. As a teacher, I would introduce this week's lesson with the following activity. For an object, I would bring in a stack of history books and just place them up at the front of my classroom, or historical novels. Uh, if you don't have any of those kind of historical books at home, uh, you could always pick up a few at the library. And for an icebreaker, I would ask my students what period of world history most interests them. And to add some variety, I sometimes like to take a digital poll from my students. Now, this is a little more complicated and, and does require some upfront work. Uh, plus, uh, you need to be teaching a group of people that have cell phones with them. But nowadays, that's probably going to be the majority of the people in your class. But if they don't, or you just want to make this simpler, you could just write the options up on the board. However, I do find that doing a digital poll is a much more engaging and, and fun way to add some variety to your class. So I'll walk you through the process. Now, you're going to go to the internet and look up Google Forms on your web browser, which if you already have a Google account, it should take you right to a page that looks like this after you've signed in. Now, if you don't have a Google account, I'm not going to walk you through all of that here. I'll let you research and figure that out on your own, but it is free and it's fairly simple. But once you're here, you're going to click on the blank form tab, which will open up a page that looks like this. And then in this section, you're going to enter your poll's title. We're going to call it Fascinating History. And then we're going to enter our question here. What period of world history do you find most fascinating? And then in this section, we're going to make sure that this says multiple choice which I believe is the default, but change it to multiple choice in the drop-down menu if it's not. And then we can go down and we can start entering our multiple choice options. And here are the ones that I've selected. Although feel free to come up with your own. So I have ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, the Roman Empire, World War II, the Wild West, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. And then here, you're going to select the other option right there. And what that does is it allows your students to write in a period of history of their own choosing that they find most fascinating. But you might be wondering how your students are going to be able to access this form. Well, now we're going to go up to the top here and click on send and then select the hyperlink icon option right here in the middle. Now, this next step isn't absolutely necessary, but usually the link is really long, 
And so I like to check the shorten URL box just to make it a little bit more manageable and then select copy. Now we're going to switch to a different website. It's called Adobe free QR code generator, right? And the address is right up here. If you want to know how to get there, or you could just search for it on Google, but here you're going to click on the create now link. And then here you're going to paste the link that you got from the other website in this box and hit enter. The page should then generate a unique QR code for your poll form, which then you can download or screen grab and copy and paste it into a slide. And now when you're teaching, all the students have to do is take out their phones and scan the QR code with their camera and they can answer the question and submit it. You as the teacher, while they're doing this, you're going to go back to our Google Forms page and as the owner of the form, you're going to be able to see the results of the poll. You're going to click on the responses tab up here, which is going to display the results in real time as they're submitted. And then it's kind of fun. You can reveal the results of the poll, uh, maybe have a little discussion about their answers. And uh, it's also kind of fun to reveal some of the other responses that students write in. For example, in my poll, it looks like somebody wrote in the American Civil War and somebody else, ancient China. Now, after you've had a chance to discuss the results, you can ask, why do you think it's important to study history? And I'm sure that there are many reasons that you can all think of to answer that question. But I'm going to answer it with the following quote from Teddy Roosevelt. He said, the more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. Well, 1 Nephi chapters 11 through 14 are history lessons of a sort. In a spectacular vision, the Spirit reveals to Nephi and all of us key elements of the spiritual histories of some of the major groupings of mankind. He's going to specifically focus on the Jews, the Lamanite Nephite civilization, and the Gentiles. And do you remember how the title page told us that the Book of Mormon was written to those three specific groups? Well, I want you to take out a pen or pencil, and at the chapter heading of the following chapters, I invite you to make the following labels. For 1st Nephi 11, Jewish history. 1st Nephi 12, Nephite Lamanite history. For 1st Nephi chapter 13, Gentile slash American history. And then for 1st Nephi 14, we're going to label this world history. And, and of course, I realize that to Nephi, this isn't history necessarily. Uh, this is the future. But remember that the Book of Mormon was written for our day, and to us as the modern reader, we're going to be shown many significant spiritual events of the past. Now, as a teacher, you can decide which of the following lessons you feel are the most important to focus on with your students. Before we start digging into those specific lessons, a quick video suggestion. The church has produced an excellent video that dramatizes Nephi's vision in these chapters. And I probably wouldn't show the entire video because it is longer, but if there's a certain part of these lessons that you wish to emphasize or clarify, I might consider showing that portion of the video to my students with the question, what does the Spirit show Nephi here and why? So lesson number one here, look, right, first Nephi 11. A suggested object for this particular portion of this week's lessons is pretty simple, but I just want to display some artwork that focuses my students' attention on the Savior. I personally have a statue of Jesus that's made from olive wood that I got while visiting Jerusalem, and I just want to display that prominently at the front of the classroom. Or if you have a nice framed picture of Jesus, 
I might set that on an easel and display it at the front. And that's because 1 Nephi chapter 11 is mainly focused on the Savior. And for an icebreaker, an old Sunday school classic, Hangman. Why not? The reason why, though, is because there is a word in 1 Nephi chapter 11 that I would really want my students to focus on and understand. Hangman draws particular attention to that word. So here's the word. It has 13 letters. Big one. And what is it? As you play, you'll find that the word is condescension. Condescension. Tough one. Uh, that's going to be a key word to understanding the message of 1 Nephi chapter 11. And if you feel that your students are going to struggle or, or they are struggling with that word, trying to figure it out, you could give them a hint by saying that the word is found somewhere in 1 Nephi chapter 11. Um, or once they discover the word to prompt your students to open up their scriptures to that chapter, you can challenge them to be the first person to find that word in 1 Nephi 11. And it appears twice in verse 16 and verse 26. But let's take a look at it in verse 16. And he said unto me, Knowest thou the condescension of God? Now that's going to be our big question here. Do we know and understand the condescension of God? And God here refers to Jesus. Well, what does that word mean, first of all? Not a word we use very often. But apparently, the life of Jesus Christ is an example of condescension. The dictionary defines it as a voluntary descent from one's rank or dignity in relations with an inferior. First Nephi chapter 11 is going to help us to understand and appreciate Christ's voluntary descent from his rank or dignity. For some context, the chapter begins with Nephi expressing his desire to see all that his father saw. So he says, starting in verse 1, For it came to pass, after I had desired to know the things that my father had seen, and believing that the Lord was able to make them known unto me, as I sat pondering in my heart, I was caught away in the Spirit of the Lord, yea, into an exceedingly high mountain, which I never had before seen, and upon which I never had before set my foot. And the Spirit said unto me, Behold, what desirest thou? And I said, I desire to behold the things which my father saw. And the Spirit obliges his request. The cool thing about this is not only does God show Nephi all that his father saw, but a whole lot more. Nephi simply asks to see the dream of the tree of life. But God gives him the entire spiritual history of the earth, right up to the second coming. Perhaps there's a profound truth in that. When we diligently seek truth from God, he often gives us more than we ask for. God's very gracious with his truth, especially if we have great desires to understand it. And the first symbol that the Spirit is going to concentrate on is the tree of life itself. So, in verses 8 through 11, he shows Nephi the tree and then asks him what he wants to know about it. Nephi's response, what's the interpretation? Now, the Spirit isn't going to just tell him the interpretation. He's going to show him. He doesn't just say, oh, it's the love of God, Nephi. No, he's going to show Nephi a specific visual depiction of the interpretation and then let Nephi define it. This is one of the ways that God apparently loves to teach his children. Now, if you stop to think about it, where else in the church do we get an example of that kind of teaching? Uh, where he just shows us things and invites us to interpret. The temple, right? All of that wonderful imagery and symbolism without a ton of explanation shows us the images and invites us to ponder and discover messages in those symbols for ourselves. So back to Nephi and this idea of condescension. 
To help him understand the interpretation of the tree, he's going to show him various scenes from the life of the Savior and emphasize how they illustrate Christ's condescension. Here's our search activity then. It's got two parts, the easy part and the hard part. See if you can do both for each of these references. And you could have your students do this as a handout, or you could just put it up on the screen and do it together. But I have a number of different pictures from the life of the Savior and some references from Nephi's vision. The easy part is to match the reference with the picture from Christ's life. The harder part is to ponder the answer to the following question for each one. How is that particular scene an example of Christ's condescension or his willingness to descend from a high station to a low one? Let's do this together. So, verses 12 through 20. What's the first scene that Nephi is shown to illustrate the condescension of Christ? The birth of the Savior. So there, Nephi sees Mary, and she gives birth to Jesus Christ. So the answer to number one would be C. But how did Christ's birth show condescension? Now, how was he born? He wasn't born as a king, but a carpenter. He wasn't born in a palace, but a stable. He wasn't born in a large capital city, but in Bethlehem. He wasn't rich, but poor. Jesus was born under the most humble of circumstances. That's condescension. He stepped down from his eternal throne of glory a position of the highest authority, to become mortal like us. I mean, he, he was a member of the Godhead, the first begotten of our heavenly parents. And yet he came to earth to descend below all things. Verse 27, number two. And I looked and beheld the Redeemer of the world, of whom my father had spoken. And I also beheld the prophet who should prepare the way before him. And the Lamb of God went forth and was baptized of him. And after he was baptized, I beheld the heavens open and the Holy Ghost come down out of heaven and abide upon him in the form of a dove. The match here is E, the baptism of Christ. How did Christ's baptism show condescension? Well, Jesus was perfect. He didn't need any of his sins washed away because he didn't have any sins. Uh, and yet he humbled himself to his father's will and was baptized anyway. Nephi is going to make that very point later on in 2 Nephi chapter 31. Jesus showed his father that he would be obedient to all of his commandments in order to fulfill all righteousness. Condescension. Number three, verse 28. And I beheld that he went forth ministering unto the people, in power and great glory. And the multitudes were gathered together to hear him. And I beheld that they cast him out from among them. The match here is A, Jesus teaching the people. And how did that show condescension? Jesus lived his life as a teacher, traveling from village to village, seeking to teach and help other people. He lived a meager existence. And what kind of people did he spend much of his time teaching? The poor, the so-called sinners, the outcasts, the sick and the afflicted. For one of such a high station and power, he spent most of his time in less than glorious circumstances and company. Verse 29, And I also beheld twelve others following him. And it came to pass that they were carried away in the Spirit, from before my face, and I saw them not. The match here is F, Jesus calling the twelve apostles. How does that show condescension? Jesus could have done this work alone. He could have single-handedly led the church and accomplished his ministry and called all of the attention to himself. But he didn't do that. He involved others in his work. He taught them, prepared them, 
gave them chances to lead and grow? And what kind of people did he call to be his leaders? Pharisees, the rich, the educated, the important leaders of men? No, no. Fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot, and other men who were not high in position or social status. Next, verse 31. And he spake unto me again, saying, Look. And I looked, and I beheld the Lamb of God going forth among the children of men. And I beheld multitudes of people who were sick, and who were afflicted with all manner of diseases, and with devils and unclean spirits. And the angel spake and showed all these things unto me. They were healed by the power of the Lamb of God, and the devils and the unclean spirits were cast out. The answer is B, the picture of Jesus healing somebody. And how does that show condescension? Jesus showed his authority by serving, helping, and healing others. And most people judge greatness by how many people serve them. But Christ taught that true greatness is judged by how many people you serve. It wasn't about telling people what to do, but service. That's what Jesus' teachings at the Last Supper were all about. And he taught his apostles that lesson by doing a very humbling, even demeaning kind of thing. He washed their feet, even though he was the greatest of all. It's condescension. And then finally, perhaps the greatest manifestation of Christ's condescension. Verses 32 through 33. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me again, saying, Look. And I looked and beheld the Lamb of God, that he was taken by the people. Yea, the Son of the everlasting God was judged of the world, and I saw and bear record. And I, Nephi, saw that he was lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. The final match, of course, is is D, the atonement and crucifixion of Christ. How does that show condescension? Well, I think Doctrine and Covenants 88.6 puts it best. He that ascended up on high, as also he descended below all things, in that he comprehended all things, that he might be in all and through all things, the light of truth. Jesus truly condescended below everything. He suffered more deeply than any mortal being ever could. He took upon himself the sins and pains and afflictions and infirmities of all mankind. He couldn't overcome all things unless he was able to descend below all of it first. The divine paradox, by descending below all things, he was able to achieve the greatest victory of eternity. Of all the individuals in this universe, there is one that understands you on a deeper level than anyone else. That's Jesus. He's traveled to both ends of the spectrum, and thus he knows and comprehends everything in between. The image of Jesus being mocked, beaten, spit upon, judged, scourged, and crucified without showing any resistance, any murmuring, any anger on his part. That's condescension in its highest form. He had the power to stop all of it in an instant, to call down legions of angels to fight for him. But yet, he suffered it. He allowed it to continue. Therefore, what major truth is being taught here? Remember the initial question that prompted all of this? What's the interpretation of the tree? Nephi's going to figure it out before we even get through all of the scenes of Jesus' life. Because the message is obvious to Nephi. Why would Jesus do this? Why would he condescend? What power could motivate somebody to leave such a high position of glory to experience such humbling circumstances, debasement, and pain. One word, love. He's motivated by love. 
So what does Nephi conclude in verse 25 about the tree and its interpretation? He's figured it out. And it came to pass that I beheld that the rod of iron, which my father had seen, was the word of God, which led to the fountain of living waters, or to the tree of life, which waters are a representation of the love of God. And I also beheld that the tree of life was a representation of the love of God. The tree is love. Jesus loves us. He loves you. He paid the price for our salvation and paved the way for our exaltation. To him, his condescension was worth that. We're that valuable to him. And let's, let's not forget the Father's role in all of this too. The tree is also a manifestation of his love for all of us. Like John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we also sing a hymn entitled, God Loved Us, So He Sent His Son. Our truth then, and let's include the message taught from both the Father and the Son's perspectives. Heavenly Father loves us, so He sent us His beloved Son. Jesus loves us, so He condescended below all things for us. And to help sink that message deeper into my students' hearts, I would show the following video that I found on YouTube that matches the message of this chapter perfectly. It shows scenes from the life of the Savior set to the song, I Feel My Savior's Love. And I'd ask my students to reflect on the Savior's love for them as they watched. And I'll put a link to this video in the video description below. Taking it to heart, how can understanding God and Christ's love help us? Or how has it helped you? Many wonderful things could be shared as an answer to those questions. It inspires righteousness. It brings happiness. It begets self-worth. And then something quick from verse 17. Nephi says something really profound when he's asked a question by the angel that Nephi doesn't know the answer to. And he says, well, I know that he, God, loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. What a great answer. We may not be able to explain to other people the meaning of all things. But if there's one truth that we can pin our faith on, maybe that's it. I don't know everything, but one thing I know for sure. God loves his children. And that's a truth that we just can't forget. So when people ask things like, if God were real, why would he allow things like the Holocaust or 9-11 or war, starving children, cancer? Or any question, why would God command early members of the church to live the law of polygamy when he knew how difficult it would be for the church? Or why isn't Heavenly Mother mentioned more in the scriptures? To this and many other difficult questions. I think that Nephi's answer is a powerful one. Now, I'm not saying that it's the only answer to these questions, but it's a good one, especially for somebody who maybe doesn't have an extensive, deep, and comprehensive understanding of some of the more complex facets of the gospel. Sometimes all we need to say is, you know, I don't understand everything. I don't have an answer for everything. But there's one thing that I do know. God loves his children. And if you know that, well, that really helps to begin from that point. If I ever begin to doubt God's love for me or all of his children, the adversary has earned a great advantage. With that, I would like to bear personal witness of Heavenly Father and Jesus' love for us. They love you. Why else would Jesus condescend so deeply? Why would God send and allow his beloved son to condescend so deeply? It's their love. That's the tree of life. 
And so I invite and encourage all of us to feast at that tree. Enjoy the fruits of that tree. Be grateful for the fruits of that tree. And never leave it. Lesson number two. A nation for restoration. Uh, 1 Nephi chapters 12 through 13. An object for this portion of the lesson? An American flag. And I would just set this up at the front and let my students know that now we'll be moving away from Jewish history and talking about the Gentiles, or more specifically, American history. And yes, I understand and believe that the history of these chapters is more than just United States history. It includes the history of the Americas. But the United States itself does play an important role in the spiritual history of the area. We're going to see that as we study. And, and please, if you are a citizen of a country other than the United States, I know that I have listeners from all over the world. Please listen to the entire lesson, okay? Uh, don't be quick to accuse me of jingoism and, and tune out. This lesson is not an exercise in sponsoring American national pride, right? It's far from it. So for an icebreaker, I like to give my students the following Picture Identification Challenge. Can you identify the following incomplete pictures? What or who do they depict? And a hint, keeping with the theme of history, they're all pictures of historical figures or events. So the first, who's this? That would be Christopher Columbus. Next. This is George Washington. Next. A little bit of a tougher one. This is the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The American Declaration of Independence. And finally, this is the first vision. Right? Now, each of these pictures are, are from American history. And the moral of the story of this activity is that when something is missing or incomplete, it's a lot harder to understand. If you've ever taken an American history class, you may have sensed that something was missing from our history books in school. I know I felt that way. And I've discovered that the reason why I feel that way is because something is missing. And it's not insignificant. 1 Nephi chapters 12 through 13 are going to put it back in. They're going to make our understanding of American history complete. So in your average American history textbook, what's going to be the very first thing that you study? What's the first unit you're probably going to cover? Now, it's not going to be the colonists or the revolution. What's it going to be? More than likely, you're going to study the Native Americans, right? Western peoples were not the first children of God on this continent. There had already been people here for hundreds, uh, even thousands of years before European explorers, quote unquote, discover it. But in their depiction of Native American peoples, what's missing? I'm going to give you some hints here. All right. Uh, what if I put uh, these names up there. What's missing? Book of Mormon stories are missing. Uh, the account of the Jaredites, Lehi and Nephi's journey, Alma, Moroni, and most significant, the personal visit and ministry of the Savior here in the New World. They never cover this in history, do they? Uh, they don't talk about these people and events as historical. But are these stories a part of North American history? I say yes. I personally believe that they are. And for chapter 12, I'm just going to give you a quick summary of what Nephi has shown because it's basically a brief synopsis of the major events of the Book of Mormon. But let's divide and label these sections as we go. Verses 1 through 3, Nephi is going to first be shown the wars and contentions between 
the Lamanites and Nephites that are going to plague his future posterity. In verses 4 through 5, the great destruction and the mists of darkness that precede Christ's visit. Verses 6 through 10, the visit of the Savior. Verses 11 through 13, the years of peace that follow the Savior's visit. And then for verses 14 through 23 to the end, the Nephite destruction and Lamanite apostasy. And an interesting note here, the angel is going to use the symbols of the filthy river, the mists of darkness, and the great and spacious building to illustrate this period of history, to help Nephi to interpret those symbols in Lehi's dream. And that's to make the point that the reason the Americas fall into apostasy and the Nephite nation being destroyed was because of the temptations of the devil and the pride of men. Therefore, they spiritually drown in the depths of hell. Now to chapter 13. This is one of my favorites. And that's maybe because I'm an American and it's kind of fun to see the history of my own nation played out in scripture especially when I believe that this is ancient scripture, prophesying future events that I know have come to pass and those prophecies stand fulfilled. So the angel is going to show Nephi a number of scenes from American history. And our job is going to be to determine which historical events he's seeing. What are they? And as we go, we're going to label them in our margins. You could do this as a handout activity. And so what I've got is a large number of different events from American history on this page. And the challenge for your students is to circle or to find the events that Nephi is being shown in these different sections of chapter 13. You could even turn this into a game and see who can identify the correct answer first. And no, Nephi is not going to see all of these things. There's only a selected few. So, makes it a little bit more challenging. Let's do this together. 1 Nephi 13, 1 through 9. Now, I'm not going to read the entire text of all those verses, but a summary. Nephi has shown the formation of a great, meaning large, and abominable church among the Gentiles. Now, that isn't one specific church. And please don't teach your students that it's the Catholics, all right? It's not. But this church slays saints, binds them down, and brings them into captivity. The devil is the founder of that church, and this church loves the material things of the world. What is it that Nephi is seeing here? Nephi is seeing what we would call the great apostasy. The great and abominable church is apostasy in all of its forms. Satan's kingdom, the world, Babylon, any person or organization that opposes God's work, will, and true disciples. And President Dallin H. Oaks taught this principle when he said, this great and abominable church must be something far more pervasive and widespread than a single church, as we understand that term today. It must be any philosophy or organization that opposes belief in God. And the captivity into which this church seeks to bring the saints will not be so much physical confinement as the captivity of false ideas. So it's a church only focused on the here and now, the what's in it for me church, the church that encourages pride and materialism and selfishness. So from Nephi's perspective, he's just been shown the apostasy of his own posterity and now he's shown the apostasy of the Gentiles. The whole world is in a state of apostasy at this point, which must have been rather discouraging for Nephi. But God has a solution in the works, a plan, a remedy for this fallen world. So to verses 10 through 12, what or who is Nephi seeing here? And it came to pass that I looked and beheld many waters, and they divided the Gentiles from the seed of my brethren. And it came to pass that the angel said unto me, Behold, the wrath of God is upon the seed of thy brethren. And I looked, and I beheld a man among the Gentiles, who was separated from the seed of my brethren by the many waters. And I beheld the Spirit of God, that it came down and wrought upon the man. 
and he went forth upon the many waters, even unto the seed of my brethren, who were in the promised land. So who is Nephi being shown here? This man who goes forth upon the many waters to the seed of Nephi's brethren? It's Christopher Columbus, right? And his journey across the Atlantic to the New World. All right, next, verse 13, by itself. And it came to pass that I beheld the Spirit of God that it wrought upon other Gentiles. And they went forth out of captivity upon the many waters. So who's he seeing here? These other Gentiles that come out of the captivity of the old world. This would be the pilgrims. Pilgrims establishing colonies here in the new world. These people that sought to escape the captivity of persecution to find religious freedom. All right, verses 14 through 15 now. And it came to pass that I beheld many multitudes of the Gentiles upon the land of promise. And I beheld the wrath of God, that it was upon the seed of my brethren. And they were scattered before the Gentiles and were smitten. And I beheld the spirit of the Lord, that it was upon the Gentiles. And they did prosper and obtain the land for their inheritance. And I beheld that they were white and exceedingly fair and beautiful, like unto my people before they were slain. And what's he seeing here? The conflict with the Native Americans, the, the Indian Wars, and the subsequent colonization of America by Western peoples. And the next, 1 Nephi 13, verses 16 through 19. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that the Gentiles who had gone forth out of captivity did humble themselves before the Lord, and the power of the Lord was with them. And I beheld that their mother Gentiles were gathered together upon the waters and upon the land also to battle against them. And I beheld that the power of God was with them, and also that the wrath of God was upon all those that were gathered together against them to battle. And I, Nephi, beheld that the Gentiles that had gone out of captivity were delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations. What's Nephi seeing here? the mother Gentiles gathering against those that had come here to battle. It's the American Revolution. In Great Britain, the mother Gentiles came against them to battle. And the colonists were delivered out of their hands. Next, verses 20 through 29. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that they did prosper in the land. And I beheld a book, and it was carried forth among them. And the angel said unto me, Knowest thou the meaning of the book? And I said unto him, I know not. And he said, Behold, it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew. And I, Nephi, beheld it, and he said unto me, The book that thou beholdest is a record of the Jews, which contains the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. And it also containeth many of the prophecies of the holy prophets. And it is a record like unto the engravings which are upon the plates of brass save there are not so many. Nevertheless, they contain the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. Wherefore, they are of great worth unto the Gentiles. Now, I'm, I'm going to pause there and just ask, what book is he seeing here? I often have students guess that it's the Book of Mormon. It's not. It's the wrong book. Which book contains the record of the Jews, which would be of great worth in early America? It's the Bible. He's seeing the coming forth of the Bible and the influence that it would have here in early America. And certainly, you have to admit that the Bible has played an integral part in American history. And from verse 24 to verse 29, the angel explains to Nephi that the Bible has lost many plain and precious parts because of the influence of the great and abominable church, which causes many to stumble. Now, now, that's fascinating, right? I've got a question for you now. Now that we've been through each of these major scenes, did you notice what each of these events had in common? There, there was something similar in the description of each one. If you're not sure, let me give you a hint. I'll pull out some of the phrases from each of the descriptions. 
from verse 12. I beheld the Spirit of God, that it came down and wrought upon the man. Verse 13. I beheld the Spirit of God, that it wrought upon other Gentiles. From verse 14. I beheld the wrath of God, that it was upon the seed of my brethren. From verse 16. And the power of the Lord was with them. 18. The power of God was with them. And also the wrath of God was upon all those that were gathered together against them to battle. Verse 19. Delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations. Verse 23. The book which contains the covenants of the Lord. So what do they all have in common? God played a major role in each of these events. He inspired or helped each of these events to take place. So what, or better yet, who, has been missing from our history books? God. His role and presence and influence has been pretty much stripped from their pages. Thank heavens we have the Book of Mormon to replace it. And this teaches us a profound and intriguing truth. What's that truth? God established America. He played the pivotal role in the formation of the United States of America and its government. Now, if that's truly the case, is there any historical evidence that the people involved in these events felt that that was true, that that was the case? If God was such a big part of it all, you'd think that the people who experienced it would have recognized it. Well, let's see. Christopher Columbus said the following, The Lord was well disposed to my desire, and he bestowed upon me courage and understanding. Knowledge of seafaring he gave me in abundance. Those who heard of my enterprise called it foolish, mocked me, and laughed. But who can doubt but that the Holy Ghost inspired me? The pilgrims wrote this as a part of their famous Mayflower Compact. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the events aforesaid. They felt they were inspired by God to do what they did. George Washington said the following about the Revolutionary War. The disadvantageous circumstances on our part under which the Revolutionary War was undertaken can never be forgotten. The singular interpositions of providence, that means help from God, in our feeble condition were such as could scarcely escape the attention of the most unobserving, while the unparalleled perseverance of the armies of the United States through almost every possible suffering and discouragement over the space of eight years was little short of a standing miracle. So George Washington felt that God had intervened to bless the revolutionaries, recognized it as a miracle. I believe that's true. I read a fascinating book a number of years ago uh, entitled 1776, and that was my impression, that it was a miracle that the colonists won the Revolutionary War. I can't see any other explanation for it. They were outnumbered, they lost more battles, they had fewer provisions, they didn't even have the support of all the colonists, and yet they won. There's, there's accounts that I read in that book where you just kind of have to sit back and say, that couldn't have been a coincidence. Even the weather seemed to work to their advantage in cases. There's no doubt in my mind that God was responsible for the colonists' victory. And then who can question the fact that God inspired the coming forth of the Bible? I mean, I think we take for granted the sacrifices that were made to make it possible for the Bible to be placed into the hands of the common man in their own language. For many years, it was illegal to have a translation of the Bible in English. 
And so I believe that God inspired individuals like John Wycliffe, Miles Coverdale, and William Tyndale to work and sacrifice to put the text of the Bible into the hands of the common man. William Tyndale was executed as a heretic for suggesting such an idea and for translating the Bible into English. The story of the coming forth of the Bible is, is way too extensive to cover here, but suffice it to say that God played a major role in making that possible. So I think we can conclude that yes, there is ample historical evidence from the accounts of the individuals who experienced these events themselves that they felt the hand of God working with them. So all of that begs the question, why? Why would God be so involved in the establishment of one particular country? Why America? And I can assure you that the answer is not because God loves Americans more than anybody else, or that they're more important, or that citizens of other nations are any less in God's eyes. That's not the reason. God doesn't love Americans any more than he loves Brazilians or Japanese or Nigerians or Samoans or Norwegians or Mexicans. There's one reason and one reason only for why God was so involved in the establishment of the United States. That answer is found in 1 Nephi 13, verses 30 through 42. The next scene that Nephi is shown in his vision. After promising Nephi that the Lord would not allow the Gentiles to destroy the Native Americans or suffer both groups to remain in ignorance of his truth forever, Nephi is shown this, 34 through 36. And it came to pass that the angel of the Lord spake unto me, saying, Behold, saith the Lamb of God, after I have visited the remnant of the house of Israel, and this remnant of whom I speak is the seed of thy father, Wherefore, after I have visited them in judgment, and smitten them by the hand of the Gentiles, and after the Gentiles do stumble exceedingly, because of the most plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb, which have been kept back by that abominable church, which is the mother of harlots, saith the Lamb, I will be merciful unto the Gentiles in that day, insomuch that I will bring forth unto them in mine own power much of my gospel, which shall be plain and precious, saith the Lamb. For behold, saith the Lamb, I will manifest myself unto thy seed, that they shall write many things which I shall minister unto them, which shall be plain and precious. And after thy seed shall be destroyed, and dwindle in unbelief, and also the seed of thy brethren, behold, these things shall be hid up, to come forth unto the Gentiles by the gift and power of the Lamb. And in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lamb and my rock, and my salvation. So what event from American history is Nephi being shown here? And why was God so involved in the formation of the United States? For the restoration. Right? God needed a place to restore his gospel. And that could only be possible under the right circumstances. And what were those circumstances? Uh, what's the recipe for the restoration? Well, let's see. Uh, God needed a place to do it. He needed religious freedom. He needed a nation that was formed by a free government. And he needed the Bible. And now, as you look at that list, do you understand why Nephi was shown those particular events? Why God was so involved in those particular circumstances? Well, Christopher Columbus, why him? He made it possible for there to be a place for the restoration to occur. It really couldn't have been done anywhere in the old world, right? If Joseph Smith had tried to restore the church in Germany or Italy or England, it wouldn't have survived. He'd have been burnt at the stake as a heretic. The restored church would have died as soon as it was born. So there needed to be a new place, a new world, far from the influence of the deeply entrenched churches and governments of the old. Columbus made that possible. The pilgrims. The pilgrims came to the new world for basically one reason, religious freedom. Colonies were established on that principle. So when a government was formed here, religious freedom and the separation of church and state was a non-negotiable. 
the Revolutionary War. There needed to be a type of government that allowed for the protection and flourishing of a new church. The rights and liberties provided by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights made it possible and continue to make it possible for the church to be established and to grow. Even though it did face significant opposition, at least it was allowed to be created and maintained. And finally, the Bible. You've got to have the Bible in the hands of the common man, in his own language, so that a 14-year-old farm boy from upstate New York can read James 1.5, which is going to inspire him to walk into a grove of trees and seek wisdom on which church to join. I really love this quote from William Tyndale, uh, uttered to the stubborn powers that opposed him. If God spare my life ere many years pass, I will cause that the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou dost. Well, it would be a boy that driveth the plow that would read his translated words and restore the true church of God. So our big overarching truth behind all of this, God established America for the restoration, for the purpose of restoring the fullness of his gospel. Now, I believe there's one more question that 1 Nephi 13 is going to answer for us. This is where we're being invited to liken the scriptures to ourselves. The question is, what is my part in this history? God never intended the restoration to take place and then to just sit here only influencing and blessing the lives of Americans. I say again, citizens of the United States are no more important, better, or more valuable to God than any of his other children. So our part is found in verse 37. If we are members of the church, what's our responsibility? And blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion at that day. For they shall have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. And if they endure unto the end, they shall be lifted up at the last day and shall be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Lamb. And whoso shall publish peace, yea, tidings of great joy, how beautiful upon the mountains shall they be. What's our part? We need to spread that message to all the world. Our job is to bring forth his Zion all over the world unto all nations, to publish peace everywhere. Yes, the restoration happened in America, but God never intended it to stay here. He just needed a starting line, a base to work from. Just so happened that the United States was it. I mean, he had to choose somewhere. He could have just as well been somewhere else. But now it behooves every member of the church to spread that message throughout the world. And we have. That message has traveled far beyond the shores of the United States. And I might add that the blessings of our form of government have also spread throughout much of the world. God intended those values to bless more than just Americans. The influence of the principles upon which the United States was founded have inspired and shaped the governments of many nations around the world. The fact of the matter is that Zion is not an American establishment. It's worldwide. What started in a grove of trees in New York with one 14-year-old boy seeking truth has become millions of disciples all over the world who have also sought and found truth. We, as members of the restored Church of Jesus Christ around the globe, are a part of something very, very special. Therefore, what? What's our action plan now? How can we let the message of these chapters change us, no matter where we live? The personal question is, am I fulfilling my role in the great spiritual history of the world? What are we going to do to bring forth Zion and publish peace throughout the world? Maybe that means serving a full-time mission. Maybe that means seeking to be a better member missionary. Maybe that means publishing peace through social media rather than discord and contention. Maybe that means serving others, donating time and means to humanitarian aid, doing temple and family history work, paying tithing, giving away a Book of Mormon. There are many, many things that we can do to help bring forth Zion 
and publish peace in the latter days. Well, I just love that chapter and its message. It gives me a deep sense of appreciation for the people that helped to prepare the way for the restoration and, and, and gratitude for a loving God that made it possible. I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to those that, that made incredible sacrifices uh, to bring us the church and the gospel that we enjoy so freely today. I don't think it matters where you're from in the world uh, to be grateful for the contents and the message of 1 Nephi chapter 13. I hope that we can all appreciate the establishment of a nation for restoration. All right. Now for the final two chapters of this week's study, I'm not going to do the full lesson treatment for them, although you very well could. There's a lot of wonderful, inspiring truths in these two chapters as well. First Nephi 14 through 15. But if I had limited time, I would spend it on the two previous lessons that we just covered, since, since they're unique in Scripture. The message of these chapters is very similar to the principles that we recently discussed and learned about in the book of Revelation. In fact, Revelation is even referred to in chapter 14. But remember that we labeled chapter 14 world history. It's kind of the big picture chapter where Nephi has shown the great conflict between the two churches in the last days, the church of the Lamb and the church of the devil. And, and he leads Nephi right up to the days of the second coming, but says that John is going to write those prophecies for us. He shows Nephi those things, but forbids him to write them. So Nephi basically sees the history of the whole world, and then his vision closes. Chapter 15 then describes a conversation between Nephi and Laman and Lemuel following his vision. They've got some questions about Lehi's prophecies that they don't understand. So Nephi comes along and he explains it to them as, as well as a number of the symbols from Lehi's vision of the tree of life. Specifically, it deals with the future of Laman and Lemuel's posterity, that they would eventually receive the fullness of the gospel following the restoration and have the opportunity to be grafted back in to the house of Israel. Now to cover some of the truths that are taught in these two chapters, I might play a little game with my students or my family. Now granted, this is going to be more geared towards children and youth. But you could always have a good discussion with an adult class by just asking the questions and having them search for the answers and then using their answers as discussion starters. But I like this particular game. It's really simple. It's called trash cut ball, right? And all you need is a trash can, some masking tape, and a ball, right? A ball of some sort that would fit into a trash can. And uh, even if you don't have a ball, you could always just crumple up some pieces of paper too. But the way you're going to set this up is to place a trash can against a wall and then tape three pieces of masking tape on the floor at varying distances from the trash can. And then with a marker uh, on the piece of tape that's closest to the trash can, I would write one point. On the second one that's further away, I would write two points. And then on the third piece, farthest away, I would write three points. And you know, sometimes just for fun, I might even put a fourth piece of tape really far away, like almost impossible to make a basket, and write ten points on it. But the way the game works is to divide your students up into teams, and I find that teams of four work well, and ask questions from the chapters. The first team to raise their hands and give you the correct answer gets a chance to shoot the ball and earn points for their team. But also about every three or four questions, I'll do a shooting round only where, where there's no scripture question, but every single team gets a chance to take a shot and earn points so that one team doesn't always get a chance and, and start to dominate. Team with the most points uh, at the end of the game wins. Simple, but effective. Uh, and to make it easier to find the answers to the questions, I divide the chapter up into sections and, and tell them the answers to the questions are in those sections. So these first questions are found in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 14. We'll go through the questions together. So according to 1 Nephi 14, how many churches are there in the world today? Answer in verse 10, two, the church of the Lamb of God and the church of the devil. Question number two, find at least two blessings in these verses for choosing to be a part of the church of the Lamb of God. Answer, a couple that they could choose from. In verse 2, 
They shall be a blessed people upon the promised land forever. Also, verse 2, they shall no more be confounded. Verse 5, it shall be well with them. And verse 7, peace and life eternal. Question number three, find at least two consequences in these verses for choosing to be a part of the church of the devil. Answer, there's a few to choose from here as well. A, a, a bunch in verse three, led away down to hell. That great pit which hath been digged for the destruction of men shall be filled by those who digged it. So their plan's going to backfire. They're going to trap themselves instead. And casting of the soul into the hell which hath no end. From verse 4, captivity. 5, perish. And in verse 7, a deliverance to the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds. Or they're brought down into temporal and spiritual captivity and destruction. Okay, the answers to these next questions come from verses 11 through 17. What two words describe the size of the church of the Lamb of God? Few and small. So it shouldn't surprise us that the church is small compared with the rest of the world. It's been prophesied that way. Question 5. 1 Nephi 14 tells of a great battle between the two churches in the last days. What two specific weapons are used to defeat the church of the devil? Verse 14 tells us that the saints are armed with righteousness and the power of God. Another name for the power of God is priesthood. The church of the devil is going to be defeated by righteousness and priesthood power. Question number six. In the last days, God will prepare a way for the fulfilling of these that he's made with the people of the house of Israel. Verse 17, his covenants. God always keeps his covenants, and they will be fulfilled in the last days. Now some questions for the last verses of chapter 14, 18 through 30. Question 7. In verses 18 through 20, Nephi is shown a man. What's the name of that man? Answer. That man is John. John the Beloved. John the Revelator. We're told that outright in verse 27. Question 8, what book of scripture is the angel referring to in verses 21 through 27? And hint, it's not the Bible, but a book within the Bible. Answer, the book of Revelation. Uh, the book of Revelation contains an account of the remainder of the spiritual history of the world. Question 9, how much of Nephi's vision did he write about to us? Answers in verse 28, a small part. Nephi saw a lot more in his vision than he's giving to us. God truly blessed Nephi that day because of his desire to understand the things of God. Which leads us to chapter 15. The answers to these questions are found in verses 1 through 11. Question 10. Why was it hard for Laman and Lemuel to understand the words which Lehi had taught them? Answer from either verses 3 or 8. Because they wouldn't inquire of the Lord. They could also answer from verse 3 that they were hard in their hearts and did not look unto the Lord as they ought. Question 11. According to Nephi, what three things must we do if we want God to make things known unto us? The answer is in verse 11. We must, one, not harden our hearts. Two, ask God in faith, believing that we shall receive. And three, be diligent in keeping God's commandments then surely these things shall be made known unto us. Verses 12 through 20 now. Lehi compared the house of Israel to what kind of tree? Answer, we can see this in verses 12 and 16, an olive tree. Posterity of Lehi's family are compared to a branch of that tree that's broken off for a time, planted in the Americas, but eventually grafted back in in the last days. Question 13. Name three bits of knowledge that the Book of Mormon is going to restore in the latter days. Answer, and there's quite a few. They're all in verse 13. The knowledge that Lehi's seed is of the house of Israel. That they're a covenant people. They're going to come to a knowledge of their forefathers. A knowledge of the gospel of their Redeemer. The knowledge of their Redeemer. The very points of his doctrine. And how to come unto him and be saved. And that's a great description of what the Book of Mormon can do for us. It restores the very points of his doctrine, 
helps us to know our Redeemer better. Hopefully we're watching for those things as we study the Book of Mormon this year. And now a few questions for verses 21 through 36 to finish out the chapter. What blessings come from holding to the iron rod? Verse 24, we'll never perish. We won't be overcome by the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary. We won't be blinded and we will not be led away to destruction. And then question number 15. The last 10 verses of 1 Nephi 15 describes the final state of the wicked. What word is repeated nine times to describe them in verses 27, 33, and 34? Filthy or, or filthiness? God must have a pure kingdom. Those that become filthy in the things of the world, uh, that refuse to clean themselves through repentance, must remain in a state of filthiness. Therefore, it behooves us to seek to be purified through baptism, sacrament, repentance, and the blood of the Lamb. And that will conclude our lessons uh, for this week, my friends. Thank you so much for taking the time to study the scriptures with me today. I really hope that it blessed you helped you in some way. And if it did, I encourage you to share it with somebody else that you feel it can help. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.